Uh, good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, uh, your host for today on Perspectives on Energy. And uh, thank you for being on, the, on for signing into the show. Uh, today is just me by myself. I am going to be your host. And uh, I normally am a director of international services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute. We provide a training for the uh, industrial skills, among other things, for the electric utility industry. And uh, today, uh, I don't have a I don't have a guest. I wanted to go into a bit more of a discussion as a follow up to last week's episode. Uh, we were talking with uh, Dr. David Gaddy on the issues of uh, viewing energy as a national security uh, perspective, right? How we're becoming highly dependent on just uh, it's either renewables or natural gas, and that puts us in, in a uniquely precarious. Uh, and dangerously unreliable uh, stance when it comes to energy and national security. Not to mention the fact that it makes energy a little bit more expensive. But we'll go we'll go into more details of what uh, what that entails. Um, I got the pleasure of meeting him uh, back in early June when I went to a conference at the uh, Association of Rural Electric Generating Cooperatives, where I had a chance to speak on the topics of renewable renewable resources, their availability and how that variable output impacts reliable operations on the grid. So uh, today we'll talk a little bit more about, about what that entails and uh, what possible problems we're facing as an industry and what solutions that we may be applying as, as we move forward. One thing I will say though, is uh, I am an engineer. I have been in the industry for 30 years almost. And uh, I, until recently, I had not seen uh, active the active subject matter experts that, that are that operate this grid in the system invited to the table to have conversations on how to best bring about these changes, right? Um, one of the things that was always concerning was the fact that, um, and, and you should get something out of the way, uh, climate change is real. We are having issues with uh, with human activity in, that, that impacts the uh, climate overall. We're seeing uh, record setting heat waves. Uh, we're seeing one right now in, in the Southwest and in Texas that of course had, an, had a severe impact for two days in a row where Texas nearly, nearly had to engage in a load reduction or feeder rotation. So that, that would have been a problem as well. But uh, again, a, a lot of that has been exacerbated by, by some of this variable uh, renewable resources and how that impacts reliability. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, and if we go up to the first slide, Mike, if you don't mind, uh, is that um, we've seen a lot of, quite, quite a, a fast growth in the deployment of renewable resources. And, and, and of course, you know, the, the major driver behind that, uh, obviously, is, is to reduce carbon emissions. Now, uh, in most of the country, the majority of the utilities, have already done away with petroleum and oil as a source of uh, generation. But the majority of these uh, power plants that are in, you know, in, in the country are running on coal, right? There's, and I won't say a majority, but I'll say a good percentage of them. I'll say a little bit less than half. And there is, there is the pressure, the, the demand and the rush to get those uh, retired. And, and what are we retiring them? What are we replacing them with? Really, it's renewable resources, whether it's solar farms or wind farms. And as you can imagine, the problem with that usually has to do with the fact that these, these resources are not very, they're, they're not base load, right? They have a lot of variability and they're not available the entire day. So until they get the, your battery resources to, to the point where they're cost-effective, easily deployable and reliable, uh, we're not going to see a lot of positive changes in that regard. So, what is it that they're that they're using instead? Uh, whether they they refit these coal power plants with something else, or they build um, a combined cycle power plant altogether, and that's the next bullet. There is a natural gas refit. So, if a power plant happens, uh, if a coal fired power plant happens to be fortunate enough to be near a natural gas pipeline, uh, well, then it's it's fortuitous in the fact that they'll be able to refit that plant and have it burn natural gas. Mind you, it's still a fossil fuel, but the amount of emissions is, is fraction, it's a fraction compared to um, the coal, right? And now, granted, those aren't as efficient. You're not going to see, you're not going to see it uh, 
operate as cleanly, for example, as a combined cycle plant. And some of these are way more modern and, and a lot more cost effective. So you see in the majority of these um, utilities across the country, whether they're investor owned, public utilities, or even uh, co-ops, they're, they're opting for um, these combined cycle plants, which is uh, usually two or more combustion turbines with a heat recovery steam generator. And that, you know, all of that's producing, uh, of course, electricity. And it's a very efficient way to make use of that fuel. Um, of course, uh, that's great up until while natural gas is still cost effective, but we've seen the uh, the rise of natural gas and prices almost uh, three to four times than what it was three or four years ago. So that's gotten a lot more expensive, right? So as, as we move forward, right? Um, with this deployment of natural gas as being the, the, the main driver of transitional fuels, now we're becoming even more reliant on this one type of fuel. So we're also losing fuel diversity. And that in itself becomes a serious problem, um, not to mention the fact that, that it puts us in a single point failure situation. But we'll cover more of that later as I make a note of that as we go forward. Uh, the other really, really glaring issue with some of these resources and the, and the way they're currently deployed is the fact that they have quite a bit of dispatch, their dispatchability, right? Uh, they can't really control them like you can, can control a regular power plant, right? Normally, you'll have a base load generation, and then you'll have variable generation, and, and then on top of that, you have peak generation. Uh, these uh, variable resources are, are forcing the, the dispatching of, of these peak generators, which, of course, are very expensive to operate, very expensive to turn on, shut off. And then of course, add to that the uh, the maintenance cycle. So every time you bring one of those units online, you are incurring a significant cost and, you're, and then you're, short, you're, you're accelerating the maintenance cycle, shortening the life of these assets. So as you can imagine uh, now you, you, and they haven't properly accounted the cost of these renewable resources, right? When when since they haven't been taken into account, the effect that it has on the rest of the generation fleet. So uh, in a lot of utilities, that's been changing. So now you see like a little slowdown, and uh, they're slowing down in the deployment of some of these wind and solar solar assets, because now it's not as not as economical as it as it once thought, or as it once thought. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Mike. Do you mind? Okay. So here's an example of uh, year over year, right? Uh, I'll, I'll show a few of these tables. And, and you're seeing here in highlight, highlighted in, in pink uh, against the white, you're seeing how many of these generators were retired, you know, how many they added, how many they retired. So you're looking at net capacity of additions, which so if it's a negative number, it's really you lost that generation, right? So here's of uh, just, year end 2021, you notice that they managed to retire 25 coal plants, which is great for the environment, right? It's great for emissions. They're, they're, they're very dirty. Uh, the issue with coal is that it's, it's one of the least expensive sources of energy, right? But I, again, the, the cost of that, that brings about on the environment is rather high. So in 2021, they got rid of 4,000 megawatts, right, of, of, of generating resources that were coal. But they also got rid of 5,000 megawatts of nuclear. Now, mind you, that's only five units. And we have not built a new nuclear plant except for one since, 19, since the 80s. So uh, we, we've let go of 5,000 megawatts of base load nuclear, which is zero emissions, very cost effective. But it has a, there, there's a general issue with, A, the, the, the optics, of course, when it comes to uh, nuclear energy. And then, of course, it's um, a lot of these nuclear power plants do have a, a licensing, which by the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that limits how long they can, their service life. So oftentimes they have to extend these licenses. Uh, I, I know a few power plants that, are, that were built in the 70s that are still running to this day, and they're, they're on their fourth or fifth uh, license extension. So, so I mean, they're, they're efficient, they're maintained well. But at the same time, you know, you see, you see the, the change. So what has replaced that generation? You see, you see the next two, two roles, wind, solar thermal, and photovoltaic. Look at how many, gener how many megawatts of generation they added, 17,000 and 16,000 respectively. Now, this tells you, um, 
out of the U.S. total, right, of what they added, net additions, uh, that is a, that is basically mo the majority of the added generation in the last year was not a combustion turbine or, or nuclear or anything, anything of the sort. It was mostly uh, solar, uh, solar and wind. Now you do see natural gas on there somewhere, right? Where you see that they they added a, now they added about uh, five thousand megawatts of generation, which is great, but it's it's still a fraction of of when compared to the wind and solar. So that's great, great for the environment. Um, that's great for the cost. Once once the uh, installation cost has been capitalized, you know all of that output is is it doesn't cost you anything beyond that. Uh, however. Now they're taking into account what the effect is for the impact that it has on the rest of the fleet. Now, as you can imagine, uh, these, these renewable resources, of course, have a lot of variability. Like during some solar at starting at 9, 10 a.m. is when they really begin to, to, to give you a good solid output. If you don't have any clouds, they'll give you solar up up until three, four in the afternoon, and it's not a it's not a flat curve, right? It's it's a nice nice like domed peak, and of course that that has an impact on on generation, right? Where where it's like you're going to have more and more of that during the day, and then eventually you will end up having to to back down or even cycle off some of your generation uh, between the hours of ten and three in the afternoon. Now, of course. Usually after four o'clock, you know everybody you know goes home. The sun begins to set. Uh, they do the cooking and lighting peak, and by this time, uh, sun setting. So you're losing all that resource when it comes to solar. So now you have to turn all those generators back on to be able to manage that lighting peak that happens in the late afternoon, early evening, and that is a significant amount of uh, of demand right, for energy at that time. And now, as soon as it comes, it goes away. And eight eight o'clock comes around, then you have to come back and cycle off all those plants. Now, um, when you take into account the cost of cycling one of those combustion turbines, they say they're about maybe seven to $8,000 per cycle. And uh, some of them are more, some of them are less. And, the, and that's a simple cycle CT. Uh, when you have to back down a combined cycle plant, that is even way more expensive and you may not be allowed to bring it back online. Uh, so that complicates things further. Right? Uh, so as you can see here, right, we're, we're shutting down coal, we're shutting down nuclear, and we're replacing it with much more wind and solar, right? So that 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 really keep, keep those numbers in mind, right? We're looking at over thirty three thousand megawatts of added generation when it comes to uh, wind and solar, and we've gotten rid of nine thousand of uh, coal and nuclear, um, taking away a lot of our diversity when it comes to generation, right? In in this regard, so natural gas over there, you're looking at five thousand megawatts. And everything else is just that now here on the logo, we don't see it too well, but hydroelectric is not that much as well. So we haven't added much hydro conventional. So at least we, we're, we're not getting rid of those, but uh, nobody's building any new dams either in, in this country. So that's another aspect of the fact that, you know, those are clean zero emission fuel resources, but they're, they're very environmentally destructive because now you, you have to create a, a reservoir, a lake where there was once a valley. So. Mike, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So let's look at 2022, right? We're already halfway through this year. And uh, this slide, I gathered it back in May. So that tells you what, where we're at. And if you can see now we, we, we've gotten rid of even more coal, 14,000 megawatts, right? So far this year. So the pace has accelerated. We're doing this a lot quicker. And, uh, but if you notice the amount of wind they're putting up is not as much, uh, they did put a little bit more solar. But not quite the uh, the, the thirty three thousand megawatts that we saw the previous year, so that's slowing down. But however, we're speeding up the rate at which we're we're taking uh, coal units offline. So that that tells you two things, right? And if you take a look at Texas this week and what's happened over there in ERCOT, uh, they're experiencing this this heat wave, and pretty soon it'll also be California, right? Where where did they, they they forecasted they NERC issued a statement uh, earlier in the year where, where these different regions were going to have trouble uh, meeting their load based on the fact that uh, their, their generation is, 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 is too variable and uh, they're experiencing uh, record, record heat waves, which of course leads to record peaks in load and demand. 
So this all is causing quite quite a stir when it comes to the industry uh, in, 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 in the East Coast, where when it comes to the Eastern interconnection, fortunately, uh, even though it's hot here, we, we've had quite a bit of mix when it comes to generation. There's a lot of hydro on this site as well, but there's also quite a bit of different generating resources when it comes to what we're creating, where, whether it's quite a bit of coal still, quite a bit of, um, not, but mostly natural gas. Right? So reliable, it's not too expensive, but the problem is that you're relying on one source of fuel for all of your power needs, which now brings me to my next point, right? This puts us in a, in a very, very precarious position from a point of security, right? Uh, it's not just reliability, but as Dr. David Gaddy said last week, and last week, I mean, uh, last, last uh, show two weeks ago, it was, um, it will become a national security issue. From the perspective of that, that if we, for example, that those pipelines for for natural gas suffer a cyber attack, well, you know, they, if they're vulnerable, then of course that puts the entire grid, not just uh, in the, in a region of the country, but across the entire nation, could be made vulnerable. Um, and along with that, right. The, Ultimately, these challenges also also raise the cost of energy when it comes to our industry, which that in itself is another problem because then now it's it, it aggravates all the other issues that we're seeing when it comes to inflation. So why am I complaining about all this today, right? And talking about the issues with renewable and variability. Well, uh, Mike, if you go to the next slide, and want to wrap this wrap that next uh, point right concisely. So what we're looking at here, right? So 2021 through 2025, right? We're, we're seeing how 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 much solar and thermal, uh, and then of course wind that we've we've added, how much coal we've gotten rid of, and but we're adding a lot of natural gas as well, right? So not, so you know, sounds great when it comes to the perspective of um, getting rid of uh, fuel sources that cause or generate a lot of carbon emissions. And natural gas is a fossil fuel, but it's a lot cleaner compared to coal. But at the same time, eventually we'll, we'll have to get away from natural gas as well. So uh, as we're relying more heavily on these renewable resources, right, and we don't have the adequate energy storage facilities, right, we're, we're going to have to find another way to actually create or serve a base load demand when it comes to these resources especially when, when, when we have the, uh, the growing energy needs of our country. Um, one of the things that, that Dr. Gaddy pointed out was the fact that um, China, for example, is investing in renewables, but they're also investing in a whole host of other resources. Uh, they, are, they are investing quite a bit in nuclear, not just on a large scale, but small modular reactors. They're investing in storage. They're investing in different types of, of, of coal. Uh, not to have it dominate their industry, but to at least have it there for diversity. And when we say diversity, it's one of the things that matter is the fact that you don't want to be relying on just one major type of fuel, uh, natural gas, for example. Um, so, so one of the things he proposed um, was to mandate at, at least a certain minimal number of, uh, of uh, megawatts to be fueled by a certain type of, of, uh, of a resource. And that at least guarantees you have that kind of diversity, right? So, so uh, you know, by all means, right? Let's go ahead and move away from fossil fuels. Let's go ahead and move away from 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 carbon emissions. But we also have to maintain the option of, of being able to fall back on any one of those uh, should we have an emergency, as we're already seeing in Germany with the uh, crisis in the Ukraine. We're seeing uh, where they have to they lost their natural gas. Now they have to bring a lot of these old coal fire plants back online refit them, retool them, and, and get them to uh, burn coal so they can actually have, get through the summer, but more importantly, get through this winter. Um, not to mention the fact that their industries are suffering. So, so that's an example, right? But uh, one of the things that we see as a, as a potential solution to all this, right, is going to be nuclear energy. Um, and so some parts of the country, even in Hawaii, I know that nuclear energy is very taboo. Uh, but small modular reactors and micro reactors are starting to make a uh, quite a big impact. Uh, a lot of them have been uh, deployed so far in military bases for for, uh, for testing, and some of these are small, fifty to hundred megawatts, quite small compared to the conventional nuclear generating plant, which is like a thousand megawatts, right? And there's usually two reactors on the site, 
or SMA or SMR, they call those, right? Those are the ones that are should bridge the gap when it comes to our energy needs and be, being able to meet those climate goals that, that we set for ourselves, right? Um, now, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the entire nuclear permitting, the process is almost set up to, to, to provide obstacles along the way for almost anything. So there's some interesting debate when it comes to the feasibility and the ease of being able to deploy uh, these SMRs uh, pretty much anywhere they're needed, right? And they're, they're, they're contained, they're sealed, uh, they're, they're, they're dispatchable, uh, and uh, one can power a town, several can power a city. So uh, now this also creates the unique opportunity where you are now free of having to build larger transmission power lines to be able to transport all this, all this energy. It can be more localized, right? So this creates a uh, an opportunity where you can have more resiliency, more reliability, and, and at the end, you have a greater amount of security, um, especially from a national security standpoint. Now, of course, we haven't even got into the issues of uh, nuclear waste and all those problems, but in a small modular reactor, all that's contained and it's easy to replace, swap out, and then they they can put a new one in rather easily. And these these are small. They're about the size of a, of a 40 foot shipping container. So uh, quite a few bases already have them. I, I know in at least two Air Force bases, they already got, got one of the, a couple of them running and they've shown to be pretty effective. Uh, Naturally, this, this of course, is going to face a lot of opposition, but as you can imagine, it's easier to fight and defeat one large nuclear project uh, than it will be to fight and try and stop and defeat thousands of small nuclear, small modular reactors. Right? So you'll be seeing quite a, quite a bit of those around. And um, again, it, it's what we get, they're also the energy storage, right? Those will ultimately be something that, that are still under, under development. Uh, legislation was made hoping that we'd get there. The technology isn't quite there yet. Um, uh, there's some promise. I mean, we've had somebody from uh, uh, Hugh McDermott from ESS here, the senior VP of development from, and uh, we talked about his, his, his battery systems and they're, they're great. They're very promising and, and they could do wonders for a place like Hawaii, for example. But of course, Hawaii would also need to, uh, the Hawaiian islands would need to have those uh, undersea transmission cables to, to, to interconnect them. So until you have that done, you you know, Kiko and the grids in Hawaii are going to have a really hard time to be able to integrate their renewable resources to actually uh, bring in economies to scale and be more reliable. So different changes have to be made, right? And 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 they're all regional dependent, right? But so, so ultimately it's my point here is that we have to view energy, right? Uh, as as a national security topic. Uh, and then, of course, with climate inclusion, we have to give ourselves diversity of, of uh, resources uh, when it comes to power generation. We just can't rely on natural gas as we transition from, from all these fossil fuels to, to renewable energy. And we also can't just solely renew, uh, rely on renewable energies. Uh, there are other countries like Russia, China, uh, Korea, even even the Middle East, is, uh, they are now investing in um, nuclear power research, right? So to the point that they have different five different types of systems and designs, uh, we are at a point where we, we, we've only built one plant, which is Vogel and uh, in Southern Company. And that, that is the only one we've built in the last, I guess, 20, 30 years. Uh, not to mention the fact that we're, we're losing the subject matter expertise in this particular field, right? We're, we're not creating new experts, whereas overseas they are. So we may fall behind uh, from a geopolitical standpoint uh, to, to these countries that are investing in a variety of energy resources where all we're doing really is focusing on solar and wind and not investing in anything else. So again, my takeaway here is that uh, we have energy diversity, start looking at uh, small modular reactors, as a, potential, as a potential solution to complement our transition away from, uh, from coal. Uh, this could be one of the answers and then it'll be a safe, reliable answer compared to having to deal with all this you know, variability that, that uh, really puts us at great risk of, of facing another blackout. Uh, Texas, for example, again, I, I use that as an example. And pretty soon we're going to be seeing more of that when it comes to California, 
and even uh, places in the Southwest. So, so definitely a lot of things to consider. Um, one last thing I wanted to bring up, right? When it comes to renewable resources, uh, we, I mean, I, we all agree that climate change is real, and we agree that that the human activity is is causing a lot of this impact on our environment. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, when we mandate legislation, we uh, that forces us to get to a certain point in, in these emissions, and we have to make these changes by a certain amount of time. It's it's seldom the engineers or the power system op operators or the power system designers that are that are invited to these this conversations and coming up with these decisions and these goals. Uh, finally, we're seeing the engineers at the table. We're seeing the utility execs uh, part of the process and conversation. And fortunately, I mean, sadly, we've we've had some hard knocks. I mean, we saw Gavin Newsom not long ago declare that natural gas was a zero emission transition fuel. And then not long after that, he even declared that uh, he would be remiss if he didn't look at every option regarding Diablo Canyon, which is the last nuclear facility in California. Um, so at that point, it becomes more of a function of economics for the power company that runs that, that, that uh, facility, as opposed to them staying on, you know, because they, they have a need for reliability. So again, th thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully I didn't drone on by, by myself too much, but uh, there's a lot of things to talk about. Next week, we're, I mean, actually next episode, we'll have somebody on there about training in the industry and what we're doing at HSI regarding uh, workforce development, industrial skills, and uh, what we're expecting when it comes to um, a... Uh, unfilled jobs for engineering in, in the next decade. So it's going to be a serious problem, but all right. So looking forward to seeing you all then. And uh, again, this is Guillermo Sabatier, Director of International Services at HSI and uh, your host for today. And uh, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.